Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. My dear friend Linda Lafredo is a teacher who believes that teaching is as much about passion as it is about reason, that it should extend far beyond the classroom, and that its success will be judged by the state of the world. So I am so pleased that you're here. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, when was the last time you were a real teacher in a real classroom. I shouldn't say real teacher. When is the last time you taught in a real classroom? Okay, let me give you two. <laughs> One probably goes back to the 70s when I was at Theodore Roosevelt High School in the Bronx. Yeah. And uh, it was a huge school. And I was a classroom teacher and five periods a day. I taught health education, I think three periods, and I taught physical education two periods a day. And believe it or not, in my physical education class, there were 200 students. <laughs> but we developed all sorts of ways of getting attendance quickly and doing uh, at least 24 minutes, because I think it was a 45 minute period, yeah. of real activity. And so what took you out of the classroom? Uh, what was the next thing you did? When I was at Roosevelt, I became the student government advisor. Yeah. And that was a hot political time. I mean, there were all sorts of things happening. And uh, there was the Viet anti-Vietnam War, pro-peace stuff. And I learned a lot. I, I loved working with the students. And so I got very involved. And that took me out of the classroom for a couple of periods. Uh, we would meet with the principal and discuss uh, everything from dress. I think, uh, you know, we had to wear skirts or whatever the dress code was. And we discussed uh, the student newspaper and uh, how political it could be. And that was a real eye-opener. So that began to take me out of the classroom. And then in, I think it was 73, I joined the staff of a brand new alternative high school called Cydia School. And that basically was a school in which students would go out into the city and meet people and apprentice. And that so I wasn't really teaching. I taught maybe mm -hmm. a subject, but I was out in the classroom, out of the classroom, and meeting people all the time. And then you <coughs> then always concentrated on the individual. Yes. And that's something that's gone straight through everything you've done. It's so true. then um, then you, what? Then you worked for Governor Cuomo right, in the division for women, right. and I happened to be working there also. Right. <laughs> and you <laughs> happened to be. <laughs> and you, um, the one th the thing I remember most is the <laughs> development of the mentoring program. Right. But how did we find those kids? Was it because of our involvement at Bedford Hills with prisoners? Or what started that the mentoring program? Do you remember? Um, the first one was women in government. And I think yes. we were thrilled because under the Cuomo administration, there was a hiring of many either commissioners or assistant commissioners who were women with diverse backgrounds. And that was the first time we had seen that. I mean, I think of Margarita Rosa. Mm -hmm. I think of you know a number of people mm -hmm. who were um, came from that group, yeah. right? And then we also had a very so you did you organized that I helped with organize. with Lynn, right? Uh, Lynn MacArthur was yeah. very involved in it, but also the uh, Taraja Samuel. Oh yes, right. from the who you met right. at an airplane right. or <laughs> a, a taxi, a, a right? Taxi, right? Yeah. And she had worked for Alvarado, uh -huh. and he the had board of ed, right, right at the board of and wanted mentoring on a large right. scale. So we started mentoring. the mentoring in terms of the women in government mentoring mm -hmm. program. By the way, I think it's still going on mm -hmm. in some different forms. And women volunteered <coughs> then, and you matched them up with whom? How did you? How did we find those kids? I think Taraji was uh, the she point person in the, the Board, board of, ed. of Ed. Yes, and then we had like uh, 15 women, all who had worked in different agencies, and they were all assistant right. commissioners, if not commissioners. Right. And it was very exciting for us. And then very early on, you organized the HIV Women and HIV Project and AIDS, right? Right. Very early on. Yeah. I think it was at the very beginning that we paid attention to women. Right. And that was what? That was teaching and nurturing caregivers, right? Yeah. Oh, it probably <laughs> one of my favorite projects. I remember uh, a woman whose name is Eileen Hogan, who was the chaplain at Rikers. Right. And she called to say, I don't know what's going on, but a number of women have recently died, and they're calling it pneumonia. It doesn't make sense. And there was a terrific advocacy group on the outside. Suki, these are familiar names, right. Suki Ports, Barbara right. Turk, I mean, terrific Women. people. And we began to have a big discussion about how come 
very few people were paying attention to women in AIDS. Not only that women were getting sick, but that women were the principal caregivers. So with Lynn MacArthur, we started a project. Uh, Lynn worked for the Division of Alcoholism at that point, in which we would meet once a month and present women's perspectives on HIV AIDS. And I, we did a little caregiving because we always told the people who came who were mostly women that they didn't have to show up till 10 o'clock, <laughs> that they should have a little slow morning, they should have breakfast. And then we had very wonderful and exciting uh, presentations, including we had one on the arts. Joya Timpanelli was our resident storyteller. <laughs> we had, we actually sang during one of the sessions, but we also had very strict didactic presentations. But it was eclectic and nurturing well, and Well, it wonderful. was also a very um, <coughs> emotional uh, pr pr profession or whatever you want to call yeah. it, right? It was great stress ah. on it. So I always looked upon it as, uh, as it wasn't a consciousness raising group, but it was a group of sis sisterhood. Right and really strengthening the people who then had to go back out and either battle for attention or funds or whatever it was. Well, two things it's happened. One, it, you make me think, is that the women themselves who were the direct caregivers, either they were in the hospitals, were seeing terrible uh, yeah. neglect, death. Remember, the stigma of AIDS right. was really around them. And, um, and we also had the women who were left with kids or right. who were sick themselves, getting them on public assistance or finding ways to take care of them. And we didn't even have places for them to live, did no. we? No, and grandmothers were suddenly taking going back, taking care of young children. Yeah. So it was a very difficult time. Right. And um, Now you've just recently picked that up again because that got <laughs> sort of, you. I mean, I'm sure you never left it with your heart, but anyway, you went into, you went back to your mentoring. Yes. And, um, which was fascinating to me, but let's do the other part of the HIV AIDS. Okay. Uh, some of the women you met then right. were doctors doing the really edge, of the, the leading edge stuff on women in AIDS, right? right? Up at Columbia Presbyterian. Yes. Well, Columbia, I, I, it was a lucky, I met somebody I hadn't seen in eight years who had been a very active member of the Group. Women in AIDS Project, Joyce Hunter. And she told me that the center, the HIV center, which is now in its 20th year, and I should say under the wonderful direction of Anka Earhart, had recently got a, a MAC AIDS grant to work in South Africa. What's a MAC? What is MAC it? is the uh, global uh, funding mm -hmm. piece of this. And they, working together with UCLA, South Africa, and Columbia, they would identify emerging leaders in the in ways of helping them think through HIV AIDS prevention with a gender perspective. Leaders in South Africa. In South Africa. So the first two groups came to Columbia and were here for eight one group for eight weeks, the second group for six weeks, and got a very wonderful and thorough training. And then they go back and for the next ten months with mentoring help, they implement a very particular program of prevention that they have chosen to do. And it's incredible. Now the cohorts three and four, three and four will take place, have taken place in South Africa. Three was just completed. Yeah. Four will be coming up, I think, in March. And will the eight weeks will take place in South Africa. And then, but you followed two, I cohort followed, two? I followed cohort two, so I'm- To I, South Africa. Well, I, I actually, <laughs> cohort two was here, and I am, uh, I'm always says, mentoring a woman <coughs> who is working in South Africa, <coughs> excuse me, and then, Cohort three, I, I was um, asked to come and be part oh, of the training for the first two weeks, which is forming the group and setting the agenda, and it was wonderful. I had never been to South Africa. Yeah. And you found people very like you. The group is, <laughs> you know, uh, yes, but just, and the, uh, especially the people who were selected for this uh, training are full of energy, full of ideas, and know that they have a really uphill battle uh, in terms of confronting this incredible While well, you worked epidemic. in the governor's office, you also started, help the inmates up at Bedford Hills start an HIV project, right? We were involved, the, the Division yeah. for Women was involved, and yes, and there we had a- Bedford Hills is a correctional facility. The maximum security correctional facility. And they did some incredible work in terms of prevention and talking to the women. Remember, many of the inmates were HIV infected because they had been, HIV, uh, they had been drug users. So 
there were many of the inmates dying in prison. And so Bedford uh, addressed that issue, and we helped bring the AIDS Institute into doing a, an incredible program there. We've got so much to talk about because I want to go back and just talk about topics, but one, the final project that I want to talk about is mentoring with high school students. Right. And right now, it's the McGraw-Hill Project. Yes. So let's talk about that a little bit. It's really, I, I love high school students, and we've been very lucky. I have a colleague, Sheila, and the, we have been, over the last eight years, uh, McGraw-Hill has supported one a mentoring program at the old Morris High School, and then yes, secondly, in the Bronx. yes, the Bronx High School, and for the last eight years, they have supported uh, a very good internship program. The kids who participate in the mentoring program are selected to participate in the internship program. They work for six weeks at McGraw Hill sites in the summer. In the summer, they get paid nine dollars an hour, which is very terrific nice. and yeah. wonderful, and we get the opportunity to work with them once a week and find out how they're doing. How are they thriving in an atmosphere that is totally different than what they really know? I tell them that they uh, get a passport to another country for six weeks. So what are they seeing? How are people treating them? How are they treating people? Uh, and they do real work for so the six weeks. So what do they see? Let's talk about um, They, uh, Interestingly enough, they see a lot of hard work. They see people working in teams. Uh, they see people being both informal and formal with each other. Uh, do, can they, do they have trouble distinguishing be between when you're formal and when you're informal? It's a little difficult in the beginning, and I think we try to help them see through that sometimes if people are very casual with them, it doesn't mean that they should be casual back. And we try to teach them the difference between people who are friendly and people who are their friends. Uh, because it's a, you know, the, the adults at the sites are wonderful, uh, but they have to remain a little formal so the students don't get confused about how informal they could be with the, uh, the mentors. This kind of mentoring started <laughs> with the Lower Manhattan. What did you call, what is that called? The, um, oh, the Futures and Options Program. Uh, that connected to the? The BID, the, the bid Alliance down for Downtown Alliance New York. Alliance for Downtown yes, New York. Right. And that was, because that's downtown in the fin financial district, it was decided that they would be good there was a good opportunity to find right. jobs. Yeah, and they were. Barbara Christen was the director yeah. of that program, and m because the business community was so involved in the bid, we were able to identify people yeah. who took a chance with high right. school students. So they worked at uh, different organizations and at Century 21, I remember. Right, yes. That kind of thing. Right. So t let's talk about <coughs> now uh, your definition of education. All right, you know, it, immediately my definition is, um, hmm. A passion for something. You want you want students to have a passion in which they really follow something they love. You know, if, if students can come out of school and uh, relate to the rest of the world in the most mature and adult way, if they can love learning, um, and if they could, you know, there's something about just being good people in a in a very constructive way. I'm I'm not sure that's a definition. We'll have to come yeah. back. But it certainly goes far beyond learning a curriculum oh. in a school. Yeah. And um, do you, th so we, we also, we've, you and I have talked about students and violence. I mean, mm -hmm. we know that from being at Bedford Hills, seeing young people who are involved in that kind of stuff and the right. drugs and everything. And also this new topic, basically new, of bullying. But um, how do you get your kids? I mean, are, do you have any kids that you think that go into a mentoring program that are on the edge of our losing them to something else? Oh, absolutely. You know, and I, I'm trying to think of, you know, in the, in, I think the internship program in particular gives us an incredible opportunity to really teach because the students see that they have a, a, a real adult role in the world. They have a real interest. One, one student once said to me a couple of summers ago, Linda, I really want to improve my vocabulary because I realize that I'm around adults and I, I'd like to learn some other words. And the other <laughs> thing is, and McGraw-Hill has been terrific at this, is many of the students we've worked with have never been to an art museum. And I just, I'm absolutely more and more committed that the arts are a way to make people's souls soar. 
and one of the things that most of the students mentioned in their graduation ceremony was how thrilled they were to go to the museum of modern art which we did twice and they both times had tours so that kind of broadening their their idea of the world and seeing that there are ways of doing things differently or thinking about things differently has been a really big theme i think in this it, program. is it is it um a ladder, or is it an entrance to going to college? Do most of these students go to college? We, <clears throat> we provide college counseling during that period. The students in the mentoring program get additional uh, support. We talk about it, and we also bring in uh, people a little bit older than they are who talk to them about careers and also talk to them about how college So how do these lucky kids get, uh, get selected? <laughs> They actually, this particular group signs up for a mentoring program. At they, Morris High School. At Morris High School. What's Morris High School? How big is that? Well, Morris now is five small schools, oh. so I have to get all my political yeah. things. Right. So it's five individual right. schools. But it's not a hard process. I mean, they, they get once a month to visit on site their mentor. So they, always, they begin to hang around the business uh, Do they travel? Um, they, their kids presumably come from the Bronx. I right. remember years ago, we had some project, and the kids never been to Manhattan. Right. They didn't know how to travel right. out of their neighborhood. Does that still happen? Uh, it's a little intimidating. Some of them do say, I'm a little afraid about traveling, or their mother will say, uh, you know, I'm sending. One young woman came with her boyfriend and another young man from her neighborhood because she didn't know how to travel around. As time went on, that, okay. that became more comfortable. And do they, I mean, they get all kinds of things. It's like a whole magic television show. They get lessons about what to wear, right? what to behave, how to go. So how can we ever do that for more kids? I don't, I, I don't think it's that difficult. It's really, the key is really the business community. Um, we had a new placement this summer at McGaw Hill, somebody who had never taken a student before. And he said to me after, Come to me early next year. I loved having a high school student. I know that I could really shape that student. So it's really about, it's hard. I, I know the business community is going through its own downsizing, but it's really, if the business community says yes, uh, it, the students are there. But and it seems that this is a great time for it because Obama is the community organizer right. and understands all these kinds right. of things. I was thinking about it the other day. I mean. Where somebody asked a question on television, what happened to the young black students who uh, in Alabama or who went into a, in a restaurant and sat at the counter? Right. What happened to all that organization and everything else? And I was thinking, what happened to the women's movement? What happened to the women who burned their bras on, <laughs> on the right. board? You know, we haven't had that. And now we've got an organizer for a president. I mean, he's really the person you would talk to about c organizing. So do you have any uh, connections with mentoring groups in other parts of the world, country? Not really. You know, and I think, I think that this program is a good model. Yeah. And I'll tell you why, because maybe also funding is a little uh, more reasonable. It's only the summer. It's six weeks during the summer. And it, it's, you know, some of the programs go, which are fine, and uh, last throughout the year. But this is an opportunity for six weeks, and I think, what do students do if they do not have a job during the summer? How could their parents support them? I mean, everything is so expensive. So the idea that you have a really focused six-week program that includes the arts, that includes even they get computer training, is really a model that should not be that hard to replicate. Do you get any replicate. children who are in foster care? I don't know. I think, we, I think they're probably, as we go along, uh, we get to know more of the students, but I don't know whether we really know that. So do you get involved? And in, so do you know anything about their communities, where they come from? Uh, not in the beginning. Gangs, it, are, I mean, uh, I, they're not the kind of people, so it's pre-selective in a way. Well, I think because probably. Because a gang member isn't going to sign up to be mentored. Not, uh, probably not. not, I, not, not I don't know, not, yeah. not necessarily. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I also, don't want to narrow that definition. I think that with mentoring, you get a wide range of uh, mentoring and internships. You get a wide range of students, and I think we we are too quick in in saying that we, uh, you know, take only selective students. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean to. No, no, I no, but I I just I think. <laughs> Do we you get involved in this whole nurturing <laughs> of talking about uh, 
date rape, violence, uh, any respect for each other. Uh, I mean, you've been involved in these in these discussions. You know, it's so hard because where do we do this? I don't know. You know, I think it's interesting because Connect told me you're the Connect is, is a domestic right. a family violence prevention program. That they were very thrilled to be working in one high school. I we try not to. You know, the summer is overload. Right. It's really only six sessions, so we add the arts because we think that's really essential. And one of the things that we've enjoyed a lot is we provide a lot of role-playing case studies. What would you do if? How would you handle the coworker who curses all the time? How would you handle the person who wants to engage you in gossip? And we say there's no right answer, so we explore all those things. Or, or maybe with the um, sexual harassment. What if somebody's looking at you or you don't like the way they're looking at you? And we try to give them responses in which they don't have to hang around a long time. You know, I feel this is making me, I feel uncomfortable around you. I'm leaving. And they get shocked that they, it could be as simple as that, that they don't have to constantly explain to people uh, something if they're not feeling comfortable. And we also encourage them, if there is a problem, to go to their uh, site supervisor or to come to us so we can figure out how to handle some of the things that happen. What, um, we, we know Jeremy Travis, that, uh, the, head, right. the president of um, John Jay College, and he's uh, written a book and a lot of stuff on recidivism, rape, people going into prison, coming out, going back in. Do, we, do you know from your experience around, are we helping <sighs> young people before they get into this problem? I've always believed that with high school students, once you get into the system, you know that, Ronnie, it's so hard to get, to out, get out. So we really have to give young people one chance, five chances, a hundred chances not to get into the system. And by the system, we mean the criminal justice. Yes, and, and it's, it's labor-intensive work, but it's also a labor of love. So, And it can work also, I mean, once you're in the system, we've seen it at Bedford Hills, the Correctional Facility for Women, if the programs are there, you can really make a difference in some women's lives. Absolutely. I guess women are totally different, though, from, from the men. Yeah, I think so. But I do, you know, that I think that programs sometimes get short shrift. Engaging people in an honest, respectful way uh, it gets you at least halfway there. You know, whether it gets you into what we always look at numbers, you know, people don't go back in, all of that. But I think that we do a pretty good job when we just spend time with people, listening to them and caring. So you're a, really an advocate for uh, doing, I mean, thinking on a, a reasonable scale. Yeah. It's not yes. the broad policy. Oh, I can't do That's I'm not your role. No. But you're very happy to advise and help people on broad policy. Right. But you want to do that direct, individual kind of thing. Does the educational system in general provide that, do you think? Probably not. You know, it's hard for me to comment now because I don't know it as school. well. but. I really, I just, I, you know, I look, for example, one way, when you hear the teenage unemployment rate during the summer, that always spins off a whole bunch of things for me. What do students do when they're not working? And if they don't have the opportunity to work, that creates lots of problems. So, I'm, I, you know, I look at it in small increments, and that would be one place that we can really take a better look You've at. You've never had a student who's a mother. Have you? Uh, probably yes. Not one or two, I yeah. think, over the years. And does that, how does that work? It's interesting. It's hard. You yeah. know, the schools that provide daycare are terrific. But we did have one student. It was really hard. So we, we'll change the program. So if you can't do five days a week and you could do three days a week, we'll do three days a week. And I'd, I'd like to just keep them engaged and, and worry less about what the, the program should look like and see if we could keep some connection with people who may not be able to do as an extensive program as we have. So you're a member of the UFT? Yes, <laughs> I am. I'm a very happy member. But of do the you go to meetings or go there to encourage people to do things similar to this? You know, I haven't. I, I mean, I do, you know, I'm retired yeah. now, so it's not quite the same. It doesn't sound like you're totally retired. No, I don't, you know, I don't know <laughs> how to get back in. Um, uh -huh. Although, I think you should. I think yeah. you should try to do that. I mean, I think that this concept of mentoring and getting and taking a, a kid, a young kid, how old are they? 15, 16? We had actually 15 year olds, which is unusual, but it's 15 they get to 18. papers at what age? I think they have to be 15. Right. Yeah. 
and, and, that's and really providing them with a guide into the real world right. is so important. Yeah, and there are plenty of way, different ways to do it. it. You know, you could do that as the mentoring program does at what formerly was Morris High School. They take the students down to the work site place. You could do a shadow day and just, you know, have somebody say, let's go meet a journalist and interview them. I mean, there's lots of ways, but meeting adults to me is really important for young people to be able to handle adults. But you do more than just meet. I mean, you can go meet a television, go to a studio and see a producer. He'll tell you about his program. But you manage somehow to get underneath that. I want to know mm -hmm. why he became a producer or to talk to yeah. the students. Go ahead. But with the, with the students, you'll somehow advise them about what to wear. You'll tell a student when it's inappropriate, right? Yes. And if I'm not the right one, I find somebody who's better than me. But you've me. taken care of that. Yes, yes. You, you help them with their vocabulary. You tell them what they can, right. what they really should try not mm -hmm. to say. You advise them on getting out of situations. So it's more than just visiting professors. Right, it is. It's really getting inside that student. Right? Yeah. I, <laughs> I want to say also the thing that, and I don't know what time it's, um, I'm very See lucky. I work best as a team. So I have a wonderful colleague. and. We could self-criticize. She'll see something that I don't see. The HIV Center is wonderful because there's a team of people. So I'm, I always feel that I'm right, a better so team player. So I'm going to encourage, go we're finished, but I'm okay, going right, to encourage okay. you to go out and do a little organizing outside of this immediate connection okay. and get other people, more people to do it. Because I'm convinced if we had more teachers like you, we'd have a better world. Thank, Thank you, you, Linda. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.